Thank you uh, very much. I'm Nick Gillespie. I want to welcome everybody to Open to Debate. We've got a great house tonight. What you're about to see, what you're about to witness, is a good faith debate between two experts on the question, is wokeness killing comedy? The audio from this event will also be turned into a radio program, so your reactions are part of the show. Feel free, actually feel encumbered to applaud when you hear something you like, but no boos or hisses. You can do a disgruntled chortle. I don't know what that is, but you know, there, that might be it. Okay, you'll also get a chance to ask debaters a question after our main discussion portion. Uh, but when you do that, or if you do that, there's going to be a microphone set up over here so you can start sidling over there, uh, you know, now, really. Um, and we're going to do that in about half an hour. But make sure they are real questions. I will, you know, uh, get rid of you with extreme prejudice. Uh, not racial prejudice, just uh, conversational prejudice. If it's not a question, make them concise and don't debate the debaters. But first, let's get started. Would you please kick off the beginning of this open to debate debate with the biggest round of applause that you can muster. Let's go. Welcome to Open to Debate. I'm Nick Gillespie, editor-at-large for Reason Magazine, and I'm guest moderating this debate here at the Comedy Cellar in New York City. We're here to debate the question, is wokeness killing comedy? I guess the very first thing we should do is define the terms of debate. Being woke or staying woke is a phrase that originated in African-American slang referring to the urgency for blacks to have a heightened awareness of social inequality, especially related to race. In contemporary usage, it means emphasizing issues of race, gender, sexual orientation, neurodiversity, and more when analyzing all social interactions. Supporters of wokeness say it calls much needed attention to neglected but systemic power imbalances, while critics see wokeness as a way of shutting down legitimate debate and discussion. We're gonna debate that tonight, but before we hear from them, we're gonna hear from you, the audience. I'm going to ask you your opinion on the topic before the debate and then afterwards to see if you might have changed your point of view. So first, let's find out, to, you know, I want you to applaud to show your opinion as it stands right now, yes, no, and undecided. Please clap if you think, yes, wokeness is killing comedy. <laughs> now clap if you think, no, wokeness is not killing comedy. And finally, clap if you're undecided. So there's some people out there who are undecided. It sounded to my ears, which are not very good, uh, that the, uh, the no side, wokeness is not killing comedy, had a slight edge, but it seemed pretty, pretty even. I want to introduce our debaters now. Arguing that yes, wokeness is killing comedy, comedian, producer, and author of That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore, Lou Perez. <laughs> and arguing no, wokeness is not killing comedy, comedian and actor Michael Ian Black. Uh, before we get started in the nitty-gritty, I want to uh, get a sense of why each of you care about this. Lou, why did you want to take this topic on? What are the stakes for you in this argument? Um, I have no other skills than comedy. <laughs> so my resume is just like sending a turd to HR you know, at this point. And I really made the mistake of saying, like, F you before I had F you money. <laughs> so this is really important to me, guys. <laughs> Michael, uh, same question to you. 
Why did you want to take this topic on? What are the stakes for you? Like Lou, I have no other skills. I uh, uh, consider myself a warrior for the First Amendment, and yet I am arguing that wokeness is not killing comedy. If anything, I think it is helping comedy. I say that as a warrior of the First Amendment. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get to it then. We want each of you to take a couple of minutes to explain your basic position. Lou, you're up first. You answered yes. Wokeness is killing comedy. You've got four minutes to tell us why. Thank you guys so much. Uh, just so you know, I went to college not too far, far from here. I went to NYU, and that's where I started doing comedy. So this is my first time back in the neighborhood in a really long time. And... I don't know, like the vibe has changed very much in New York. Like I took the subway here and I was on the subway car and I looked around and everybody was on their phone. Everybody just knows in their cell phone. Not one person was watching me masturbate. <laughs> and I was trying to connect, man. I'm a comedian, I'm trying to connect. You know, when the debate was announced, uh, everybody who reached out to me was like, is wokeness killing comedy? They're like, is that even debatable? Like, yeah, like, of course it is. Which put more pressure on me, because I'm like, if I lose, man, I suck. <laughs> and I was also a little nervous too, because, you know, the reality is, I fear that the systems of oppression might keep me from winning this thing. <laughs> After all, Michael Ian Black is way more successful than I am. Also better looking. And he's a straight white man. <laughs> now for me, I am a Latino. <laughs> my full name is Luisa Mate Perez. And my father is an immigrant. And I do not have anywhere near 1.7 million Twitter followers, dude. <laughs> Michael has all of the power. Yeah, and to make matters worse, to make matters worse, I took a 23 in me. The results came back today. Turns out I'm 4.8% indigenous American, which means that I'm more oppressed than I ever knew. So not only will Michael Ian Black be punching down on me, but he'll be doing it on stolen land. <laughs> of which I own 4.8%. It's very important when we're having a debate about wokeness for you to know about our identities. That's very, very important. And thank you so much, Nick, for defining woke because I came into this and I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but wokeness deals a lot with power structures. You know, there are, the system is structured to oppress certain groups and raise other groups up. And the, and the group at the top, straight white men, like Michael. <laughs> In fairness, I'm barely straight. <laughs> I did not yield my time. <laughs> my people have been spoken over too much. <laughs> But what does wokeness look like in practice today? Well, you get things like the word Latinx, which I do not identify with. I know that every time a white person says Latinx, an angel gets an NPR tote bag. <laughs> with wokeness, you get things like, for all you people who showed up here on time, you are perpetrating white supremacy. <laughs> now, it would be one thing if wokeness was just like goofy stuff we can laugh at, but there's a very strong censorship component to it. Right? And it's also a problem because wokeness has infected every institution, academia, media, entertainment, so they actually have the power to shut you down, to shut you up. So that's why I'm here right now, because at its most basic level, wokeness is a puritanism that strangles creativity, kills joy, and as Michael and I will show, is killing comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lou Perez. Michael Ian Black, you are arguing no, wokeness is not killing comedy. 
You've got four minutes. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Lou and I actually have a lot in common. I also went to NYU just down the street here. Yeah. I also masturbate, so I also am slightly swarthy, I feel like. I mean, I feel like we share that. You're slightly swarthy, too. I feel like we have three swarthy gentlemen up on this stage. We're it's all a, passing. It's a real rainbow coalition. <laughs> and Lou, that was a very funny, entertaining, four minutes of comedy which really did not address the central question in the debate, is wokeness killing comedy? I was all set. I wrote notes to refute your points. Sadly, you made no points. It was funny. But like a lot of stand-up comedy, you know, it didn't, it didn't really, it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, uh, make your argument for you. I will make an argument uh, against wokeness killing comedy. Um, and I think, I think the reason you were struggling, perhaps, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is there is no evidence that wokeness is killing comedy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we stand, we sit here today in the comedy cellar, just down the street from the other comedy cellar. <laughs> they had to open this one because that one was doing such gangbusters business in this age of Me Too and wokeness. You can really point to no comedians who have had their uh, careers utterly derailed by comments they may have made, other than perhaps Michael Richards, and I think we understand why. Um, if you don't recall, Michael Richards got on a stage not so different than this one and just started screaming the N-word for about three minutes. That didn't go over well for him. But he may be the rare exception. The fact of the matter is comedy is alive and well and flourishing in ways that it never has before. And more importantly than that, it's flourishing with a much uh, a, a broader spectrum of people than it ever has before. It's no longer just swarthy guys sitting up on a stage. I'm glad that uh, it's dudes up here debating this because this seems to be a problem really only among dudes, and in particular, mostly white dudes. Um, you do have people like Dave Chappelle who complain about it because he can't make as many transsexual jokes as he thinks he deserves to make. And I should rephrase that. He keeps making them. Nobody is stopping him from doing so. Nobody is stopping any comedian from performing any kind of material they want. The difference is audiences are a little bit more Sensitive, perhaps, and I'm not going to say sensitive, I'm going to say discerning. They're more discerning than they used to be. A good friend of mine, Mike Birbiglia, who's a really great comedian, had a joke in his act a while ago about how he could never compete with the comedian who used to get up on stage and just go, hey, how many, and I can't say the word because we are on NPR, uh, uh, he would just go, uh, hey, you're a F word, and you're an F word, meaning a slur for gay people, and it would get huge laughs. We don't make those jokes anymore because there's nothing inherently comedic about calling somebody a slur. Wokeness sort of awa awakened a lot of comedians to that point. It is wokeness that said, hey, if you want to come up on stage and make ethnic jokes, that's fine, but at least have a smart point of view about it. At least be able to defend your material instead of just getting up on here and slamming various ethnicities for no reason other than it's easy to do. Uh, and with that, I yield back. All right, that's our opening statement. Uh, we're gonna. Go I won. Over. Did I win? <laughs> oh, you got it right. You got it right. Oh. You, know, you, you were born on third base. It doesn't mean that you're gonna come. In third. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, all right. Thanks you to. Uh, thanks to you both. We know where you stand and why. We're going to dive into our discussion. Is wokeness killing comedy? After this. Okay, welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm guest moderator Nick Gillespie. We're at the Comedy Cellar in New York City debating the question, is wokeness killing comedy? 
We've just heard our opening statements from Lou Perez and Michael Ian e. Black. We're going to move into our discussion right now. I just want to very quickly summarize, I think, and guys challenge me on this. Uh, Lou, your basic position is that wokeness <laughs> is censoring uh, the minds of comedians and it's strangling creativity. Michael Ian e. Black argued, no, comedy is more successful, more popular than ever. There's a broader spectrum of comedians, and the only people who are arguing about this are mostly white dudes, which this, two-thirds of this, uh, of this uh, dais seem to be white dudes. Okay, so let's start our discussion. We're going to talk for about 25 minutes on that. Lou, I want to go to you first. Does the, do you agree with Michael that comedy is bigger than ever? And if so, does that undercut the idea that wokeness is somehow strangling creativity or, or killing comedy? Well, I think something we need to talk about, uh, and Michael has brought this up before um, in, in his opening, the idea of if you're going to make a, you know, an insensitive joke or a joke about race or something like that, you should have re a good reason to back it up that you did that. And that actually flies in the face of wokeness. Because for wokeness, intent doesn't matter. Impact matters. So you can, you can craft like the most amazing joke about race and, and racial dynamics and all that. But if, it, if it's capable of doing harm to somebody, then it's a big no-no. And that's when people can actually you know, come back at you for that. And as far as you know, things being you know bigger now, like yeah, th there's opportunities there to you know get yourself out there. But ultimately, what I what I'm concerned about is the material that's coming out and where people fear to to go, fear to tread. Do you uh, can you uh, just uh, focus on that a little bit? Do you feel like people are doing, I don't know, less racial, less sexual uh, content than they were doing? I don't know, 15, 20 years ago? Or how, how might we measure that? So, so I've been doing comedy for around 20 years. I think Michael's been doing it maybe like uh, 30. And one of the, one wow. of the things that I happened... Just, uh, he looks uh, like it, doesn't he? Uh, one of the things... I thought this was going to be respectful, Lou. <laughs> so one of the things that I had to do, you know, I, I had to research and you know, go back and, and check out old material that, that Michael did, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's what the culture tells us. Like, hmm, here's a guy who's pro-woke. I wonder what dirty secrets he has. And honestly, I felt like a dirtbag going back and, and doing that. Because, sure, Michael has done blackface with Stella. <laughs> he has done Asian face with Stella. Rape jokes, jokes about Puerto Ricans, pedophile jokes, but also... AIDS jokes. AIDS jokes. He has, a, he has a poem he did, it's called, If I Had a Slave. <laughs> Which is brilliant. It is awesome. It's such a great thing. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that a comedi another comedian made that I'm like, damn, I wish I, I, wish I had uh, thought of that. I wish I could have done that. And he did it already. And Michael has so much material out there that today would be a no-go. But he had the freedom and the courage to do it and to test the boundaries of it. And now he's saying, well, can't do that now. And I, 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 have, a, I have an issue with that. Uh, do you want to recite? I have a story. I, I was actually going to Google it to see if no. I could, but I don't have internet down here. Uh, but the basic, the basic gist is, if I had a slave, I would be such a good slave master. Yeah. It's amazing. It's it's incredible. Really. <laughs> but the fact that I'm able to come up on this stage and say that and get a laugh, I feel like this proves your point, which is that, yes, I, I feel like I can still do that material. Um, blackface, I don't think I would do anymore, and I think that's exactly right. But the question is, and we did it once for a television show called Stella on Comedy Central. <laughs> so the, point of the, the point of the blackface was to actually show how offensive it was. Um, and the Standards and Practices Department at Comedy Central approved that joke. Would they approve it now? Probably not. You're probably right about that. But, but you're talking about, I think, minutia in the larger scope of things. Um, the fact of the matter is, Nick, you asked the question, uh, are people doing less sex material or race material or what have you? And um, 
you know, I have been around comedy 30 years. Come on, Lou. <laughs> I'm only 26 years old. <laughs> and what I have noticed in my time in comedy over these however many decades is that material does change and it does respond to kind of the social mores that are sort of uh, percolating right now. There was a moment when uh, we had a terrific opening comic named Ginny Hogan, who you, uh, if you're listening on the radio, didn't see or didn't hear, but she was great. She had a joke, a really funny joke, that she said she wrote during the Me Too movement, but couldn't. Ginny, come up. Can you say the joke? I don't like it. Yeah, come on up. Say the joke. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Are you forcing her? her mouth. So can come you, up here. And tell can her. you break the fourth wall in yeah. radio? Because yeah, yeah. we're doing it. There's no. no rules in debate. That's fa <laughs> Debates famously have no rules. That's, that's why we fought a revolution with England, right? I didn't know we could bring guest witnesses. Because yeah. I have, like, I got a physicist out there who's ready to say anything I want him to say. Uh, Jenny Hogan, please. I don't, I don't want to take sides, but I didn't stop telling this joke because it was offensive, but it is... Okay, I'll tell the joke. I, the joke is, I only like gentle sex because I'm a very light sleeper. <laughs> That's a great joke. That's a great joke. And Ginny said, Ginny said she wrote it during Me Too, but then didn't quite feel comfortable doing it during Me Too, or the sort of the height of the Me Too movement, but now sort of feels like maybe she should bring it back. So you're seeing kind of social mores sort of ebb and flow kind of in real time because Me Too obviously wasn't that long ago, or the height of it wasn't that long ago. It's still obviously undergoing Russell Brand. <laughs> um, but people's sensitivities kind of rise and fall with the tides. I don't know that that's a bad thing, and I don't know that it's a bad thing for comedians to respond to that. Right. Can I just uh, follow up on that a little bit, though? Um, is it a bad thing if things get judged by contemporary mores looking backwards? So, I mean, would there be a blazing saddles uh, under today's kind of, you know, woke atmosphere? I feel like blazing is saddles is like kind of the de facto movie to go to well, when you're talking Tropic about Well, what about Tropic Thunder? No, no, wait, I, I, I agree with Michael. It's um, in, uh, With blazing saddles, I mean, something that, that people don't uh, acknowledge is that I personally don't think it would be made today because the uh, the ending is so insane. You know, it's almost like I think it would just like put production just way over the limit. You know, I think there'd be other reasons. Bu budget for wise, it. you mean? I think budget wise, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We agree. From a budget point of view, Nick, there's no yeah. way. No way. Pick a better. Uh, you know, uh, it is. It does end with a bunch of Nazis, and Nazis are still in movies. Oh, oh right. God, I love but the Nazis. You know, what about more recent, more recent movies like Tropic Thunder or The Ringer, which? Uh, you know, focus on Special Olympics and things like that. And I'm not saying those movies have to be made, but is it a sign that wokeness has throttled the, you know, range of material that's going to be used? Well, unfortunately, it's impossible to look backwards and say, well, this would get made or this wouldn't get made. And I don't know that it's a particularly useful exercise because things that we're making now may not have been able to get made then, for example, I don't know that Barbie would have been greenlit in its current uh, form uh, 10 years ago, but it is now. And part of what's so good, and I will go further to say that uh, the wokeness is actually good for comedy, part of what's so good about it is the trickle-down effect. When we start saying we as an audience or we as performers should be more sensitive to the kinds of things we're saying or um, have maybe stronger opinions about the kinds of things we're receiving, what it does is it makes comedy um, a safer space for people who weren't necessarily performing comedy before. Uh, as we talk about material that's changed in the last few decades, let's look at the, the kinds of people who are performing comedy. I've seen um, the percentage of women grow exponentially in the last few years. The percentage of South Asian, Middle Eastern, people of different um, walks of life. That in and of itself isn't important. What is important is that people from different walks of life bring different unique voices and experiences to a stand-up stage, to uh, a, a, a television set, a movie set, a podcast, a funny book. And who knows, in a few decades, maybe they'll be on this stage. 
in this debate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nick, Nick, if, no, I, can, if, no, if no, I can just I jump in. Yeah, yeah cause can I'll, you, you I'll, well, a couple you, of things I'd like to talk, uh, would you, I'd like to, to uh, point out. Yeah, would you address, um, say what you're going to say, and also, um, if, if you're not, also factor in this question of trickle-down comments. Um, is that a good yeah, thing? Yeah, they're, they're all thing? Reaganites. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he knew how to tell a joke. Well, so, something, uh, you know, something to say, like, I'm, I'm not necessarily concerned about the stuff that's already been made. Uh, even, uh, you know, even all the examples of, like, of scenes that need to be cut in order to be, uh, you know, more palatable to a modern audience. Take something like Raul Dahl, where, you know, uh, using words like fat, that's just going too far, but you should uh, stick a strap on on a kid, and then that's how you, that's how you really. Wait, is there a Raw Doll movie where there's a strap on? Um, I'm working on it, man. <laughs> so, you know, we, um, one thing that, that I think and, we need to. Just, just to clarify that so people understand, yeah. Roald Dahl, you know, the venerated ch ch uh, children's author, his books are going to be rewritten by his literary executor and his publishing house to stop calling characters fat, bald, short, ugly, and the like. Yeah, they're going to be uh, brave now. <laughs> yeah, that, that's I mean. Are they going to do anything to um, ameliorate Raul Dahl's virulent anti-Semitism? Yeah, or, 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 or the murder they're, they're, of they're children. They're still working on that. They're working on that. That's, you know, after this project. So, so um, when, it comes to, when it comes to representation, right, and one of the things that I find is really interesting, um, in surveys, uh, uh, there was um, there's an, uh, a writer, Wilfred Riley, he's the author of the book Hate Crime Hoax. And uh, to quote him, for several studies, the only group that strongly supports the movement of speech in a more woke direction is made up of young, liberal, white women. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who grew up in the 80s and 90s consuming comedy, most of the stuff that I watched were black shows in living color, Whoop. living single, Whoop. rock, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, when it came to movies, Eddie Murphy was my god. There was a time where I almost feel like I'm like living in a different alternate universe where I'm like, don't, don't you guys know that the voices that we used to have were, were everywhere and they were amazing. And so it's sort of like we're, we're sort of playing up this thing like, oh, we need more and more uh, representation as if we've never had it before and as if it wasn't at a, just an amazing time to grow up as a fan of comedy. Uh, okay. if you want to... Yeah. Uh, I guess part of the question is if wokeness has ushered in uh, more types of people or it has made space for it, mm -hmm. um, is that important? Is what yeah. Lou's saying... Yeah, that is important. No. It's important for the reasons that I said. Not only because... Uh, I do think there's something important and valuable about audiences seeing themselves reflected in the uh, on, on people they see on stage, or on TV, or on movie. Doesn't mean in a movie doesn't mean that you exclusively uh, have to feel connection with people who maybe physically resemble you. Or, uh, yeah. But I think there is something valuable, and I know there is because somebody like uh, Atsuko Akusana, I think that's her last name, who is a, new, uh, a, a Japanese comedian who's just sort of popped in the last year or so. She talks about how, for example, when she was growing up in the 80s and 90s, Margaret Cho had a sitcom on, and it was Margaret Cho who sort of gave her the idea um, that an Asian woman can get up on a stage and do this. And we see those kinds of stories time and time again. So I, I, I do think it's important. I do think that more voices um, can only help comedy. Broader voices can only make comedy broader, richer, deeper, and, and more interesting, ultimately. Uh, I want to go back to something uh, that Michael uh, said when he was talking about trickle-down comedy and saying that wokeness actually makes people, kind of comics, work harder to get their jokes across. John Cleese uh, of Monty Python fame uh, is on the record as saying... No idea who that guy is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, but he said, uh, you know, in the current climate, and both of you can get on this, but let's go to Lou first, you think of an idea and you immediately think, oh, is that going to get me into trouble? Uh, all of that stuff immediately stopped you being creative. Lou, that echoes some of what you were saying. I'm not accusing you of plagiarism. 
But, you know, is that is that what's going on? And you were saying you don't want to look at things that were in the past, but is this a question of what is not being joked about? Yeah, so uh, in, in my experience, you know, we could... We can go down a list of, uh, you know, well-known people who have been, you know, supposedly canceled or, or not canceled. And uh, in my own work, I can tell you that I've had experiences where I've worked with uh, collaborators who I've known for years and worked with on a number of projects where they've asked me, please don't credit me on this video because there's, an op there's a chance that it could derail my career down the road. Um, in my books, uh, in, in my book, um, there's a chapter I, I uh, titled Letter from a Coward of a guy who reached out to me and said, yeah, man, I really like that post and I was going to comment on it, but I didn't want to get in trouble at work. Um, you know, recently uh, there was uh, the Washington Post reporter Dave uh, Weigel who got into trouble because there was a joke that was posted on Twitter that he liked and shared, I believe, and it w the joke was, every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. <laughs> now, you guys all laughed, but, all. but the people here, <laughs> all of you guys laughed. <laughs> but uh, Dave Weigel went under uh, immense scrutiny. Uh, fellow journalists at the Washington Post wanted him to not only apologize, they didn't want to work with him. They claimed that he was making an unsafe environment and all that. That is the environment that up-and-coming comedians are w trying to work in right now, where liking the wrong joke could derail your career. And I think that it, it makes it a, a very, very tough time. In, in, all re in, a, in uh, a genre that's already tough, genre is a really nice word, uh, it's well, already media. tough to try to make, so to make something new, to make something great, to make something original, and then adding that pressure on it, I think, is, uh, um, gets in the way. But, but Dave Weigel is a journalist working at a newspaper. Whether his, com com his peers disagreed with him liking a joke has nothing to do with the idea of whether woke comedy, woke, woke, woke Mrs. Killing comedy, um, the two are unrelated. I, and and I, I just question, I mean, I'm, I, I, guess, I, I guess what I want is evidence that somebody liking a joke has derailed a comedian's career or affected comedy. Well, can we talk uh, about a couple of examples? No, uh, not, uh, if you, uh, I mean, not if you not if you have some at the ready and yes. I'm unprepared to defend them, then no, absolutely not. They are all in this room right now. Step up, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yes, yes, let's or, talk about or, examples. Um, so, uh, Kevin Hart, uh, yes. in 2019, he, was gonna, he got the gig hosting the Oscars, um, and then he was fired because of old homophobic tweets and jokes that he did. Yeah. Um, Shane Gillis yeah. was fired from SNL also in 2019. This was not a good year for, uh, for comics, I guess, due to podcast appearances in the past where he did ethnic voices and jokes. Uh, again in 2019, Roseanne Barr fired from her sitcom reboot in 2019 after posting racist tweets saying Obama advisor about uh, an Obama, a past Obama advisor. Uh, and then we can go back to 2011. Gilbert Gottfried, uh, the late Gilbert Gottfried, fired as the voice of the Aflac duck after making jokes about Japanese earthquakes and the ensuing tsunami. So those are a couple of examples. How is that, that has nothing to do with wokeness, at least killing these comedians? I think we have to gifts. make a distinction between killing comedy and getting canceled off your corporate network television show. I mean, when you talk about Shane Gillis, Kevin Hart, or Roseanne Barr, you're talking about very specific examples of people on very high-profile um, network broadcast television shows. Those networks have always been incredibly conservative. I mean, the language has always been conservative. Uh, sexual situations have always been incredibly conservative. If you expect to, uh, in the case of Roseanne Barr, go on Twitter and make just racist comments and expect your corporate job to not react to that in some way, I wonder whether anybody in here who has a corporate job wouldn't expect to get some sort of reprimand for referring to one of Obama's chief advisors as something out of Planet of the Apes. I expect they would. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with killing comedy. I think it has to do with not being an idiot 
when you have a very high profile corporate gig. In the case of Kevin Hart, um, I actually think that is a pretty good example of somebody who maybe um, it went too far for. Um, because I think, he, I think, and if, if, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken, then forgive me, but I think he did apologize for those jokes and those comments. That being said, Kevin Hart has done just fine since then. And Shane Gillis, by the way, also has done incredibly well since then. And as somebody who performed in blackface, is there a... <laughs> It was highbrow blackface. It wasn't this. It wasn't this minstrel show. But is, is there a statute of limitations, or does that, you know, when somebody like Kevin Hart say, you know, is I mean, does that portray a wokeness that really is kind of trying to squeeze? Uh, Lou used the term uh, Puritan. You know, going all the way back, where there's a sin that's committed and it can never be remedied or anything like that. Is there a statute of limitations? on this sort of stuff. And if there isn't, does that suggest maybe wokeness is a real factor? I, I, my, my personal opinion is it's a matter of individual individuals, how they feel about a performer and whether they want to forgive a performer for something they may have said or done in the past. I don't know. Like, there's people, this isn't about wokeness, but there's certainly people who have said, Louis C.K., oh, I don't care that he you know, did what he did. I'm going to go see him at um, whatever. And that's got to see him on a it. twin bill with Gallagher. Right, where you just want to put a poncho. Rest in peace. <laughs> Rest in peace. Rest in peace, Louis C.K. Oh, I, I was mistaken. I did not understand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to break the news to you guys like this. <laughs> you know, Lou, I, I, I do think that Michael, Michael raises some good points that a lot of the people who get, uh, who get trotted out as examples of, you know, where wokeness has killed comedy or, or stopped careers, end up doing, you know, pretty well. Um, is that a is that a point against your argument? Well, I mean, there are people who survive assassination attempts. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> you know. So uh, a lot of people have done well in spite of the uh, uh, attacks on them. You, you brought up uh, Shane Gillis, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Shane Gillis, the guy is a great stand-up comedian, and he's a great sketch comedian. 15 years ago, he would have to be on TV, you know? And there, I believe there are so many uh, really ta talented people who fortunately are able to make a living, you know, doing comedy in spite of the crap that they had to go through. But at the time, I mean, people were saying like, treating it like, oh, whatever, you know, uh, no SNL, he'll, he'll find gigs elsewhere. You're talking about uh, a comedy institution that launched the careers of so many legends. And to have that taken away from you is not something I think is just uh, easy to, uh, you know, to, to uh, brush under the rug. Um, and, and also, you know, with a lot of the people who are doing well, I mean, a lot of, you know, we could probably talk about how um, comedy is doing with online stuff. You know, all the great comedians that are, that are making stuff online. And nowadays, like, if you want to see great stuff, you got to go and, you, and watch online. But there was a time, again, when we were coming up, where the vanguard of comedy was happening on the screen, it was happening on TV, both in cable and network. And as a fan of comedy, right, I want it to be that I, I want it to be that I need to catch those network TV, uh, TV shows again. I want the greatest stuff to be there. I want so much comedy. But where, but you know. where was the edgy, anti-woke comedy go, uh, on network television when you were growing up? I mean, you, maybe All in the Family? I mean, that, that's no, I'm not that old. <laughs> Dear you. No, me neither, obviously not. I mean, I, oh, I just, it's something I'd read about. I, I would, uh, <laughs> on a CD-ROM. I would say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think In Living Color was great. I think Martin was great. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the ongoing characters, too, if i, I got to remind you guys of, is that uh, on a lot of these shows, there was like always like the, the, the one like black race-conscious dude, right, who like saw conspiracy everywhere, who was basically the proto-woke guy, and they always goofed on that dude. And they're like, no, nah, it's not racism. You don't have a job. You're lazy, dude. Like, these were normal jokes that we would hear. And now... That guy who believes that he gets a PhD and a grant to uh, you know, do research at Boston University, uh, <laughs> Dr. Kendi. 
<laughs> Peace be upon him. Uh, <laughs> final comment before we close out and go to the audience sure. participation. I would segment. just remind people that one of, uh, I think a good synonym for what we're talking about here is political correctness when it comes to comedy. It's political correctness has always been an issue in comedy. It goes back to the very beginning of comedy. It certainly goes back to, um, you know, just fairly recently, Bill Maher used to have a show called Politically Incorrect. And he and it was about, again, like standing up to, it wasn't called wokeness then, but it's standing up against wokeness and saying the things that no, that everybody's afraid to say. And Bill Maher he, got canceled for <laughs> saying that the hijackers were brave for flying their planes into the World Trade Center. Um, is that a joke that should have made him canceled? I don't know, but he certainly landed on his feet. George Carlin got arrested. Lenny Bruce got arrested. Like, there's always been this tension in comedy, and comedy has always managed to find a way. Because you can't kill comedy. It's, it, you know, you can't kill... Lord knows you, we're trying. And, we're gonna, <laughs> and we are going to kill this uh, segment right now. We're going to wrap up our discussion there. And when we come back... We're going to hear questions from the audience. Is wokeness killing comedy? We'll be right back. Hi, uh, Jesse, Michael, Lou, who I know a little bit. Uh, question for Michael, which is, First of all, you guys should upload Stella to YouTube in higher quality. <laughs> it's a major societal issue. Okay. I was hoping Please. to address it. Uh, More don't, comment than no question. speeches, no speeches, <laughs> just, uh, just questions. You said if someone gets on stage and just uses ethnic slurs, that's not humor. That's sort of what gets me about this. I'm sort of more on your side of this issue, but like humor is what makes people laugh. What's like the principle here? Because there don't, doesn't seem to be con um, coherent principles about punching down or what you can or can't make jokes about or anything else. You, can, you can make jokes about anything. I would encourage people to make jokes about anything. I mean, as I said, I am a First Amendment warrior. Um, <laughs> but there, but there, but but there's a difference between. Um, just sort of pointing out somebody's ethnicity and using the sort of laziest tropes about it as humor, which may, and I, I guarantee you will get laughs, um, versus having a sort of thoughtful take on ethnicity or sexual orientation or gender or whatever. And I think this movement has actually elevated comedy to make comedians, good comedians, more thoughtful about the jokes that they make. Because they can't, it's harder to, 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 to stand on those crutches. Thank you. Lou? Yeah, um, so I would say, you know, uh, there's something, you know, interesting about like a Don Rickles routine. You know, he, he can go he can make fun of people. Um, and one of the things about, you know, wokeness is, uh, you know, how it pushes against the individual, that each one of us has an individual experience. And instead of that, it, it starts just making groups and this idea that everybody in this group has a, uh, a similar experience, you know, whether it's the black experience, the gay experience, the- and It's uh, the opposite. You know. It's actually the opposite. Like Don Rickles is doing exactly what you just described. Don Rickles is the guy so, saying, so I, I hey, guess, there's a black guy, where, where's the bone in his nose? Right, like so, that's a typical Don Rickles joke. So, so um, I, I need to correct myself. Basically, wokeness is the updated version of Don Rickles without the punchlines. In a way, and I want to give you an I want to give you an example Wait, can here. Can you unpack so, that a little bit more? Because I'm not sure that wokeness. I, I, I don't know what Don Rickles. I, I I have a, a paper that I'm going to write uh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> wokeness is the new Don Rickles. <laughs> um, so w w one example that that I want to give you guys. I don't know if you guys uh, read recently in the New Yorker, but there was a, an interview with the comedian oh, Hassan well, Minaj. The New Yorker. I'm yeah. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, with Hassan uh, Minaj, and it turns out that. That Hassan, uh, who is a Muslim American, he made up a lot of the stories that he tells in his stand-up, and when called out on it, uh, instead of you know admitting, oh yeah, they're lies, what he called them was emotional truths, right? And he's sort of playing a part. He's playing a role in this sort of identity politics thing, where all you know Muslims have the same experience. Now, I just want to put it out there. This is a guy who came up, who grew up, you know, like after 9-11 and went over 20 years as a Muslim American without having a racist experience. So much so he had to make them up. That's something we all as Americans should be proud of. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, let's go to the next question. Can we hear from a woman? Do you want me to raise my voice? <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, Lou, you mentioned that you're a you came here to argue that wokeness is killing comedy and your opening act was making fun of woke people, which kind of seems like they just gave you a bunch of material to work with. <laughs> and so I, I guess my question is that is most comedians today get their followers on Instagram and TikTok, but as long as those platforms aren't censoring comedians, isn't wokeness just giving you good material to write jokes about and you can get your followers that way? You know, I... Um I hear I hear what you're saying there. The, the one one thing is like anyone who, who's you know a creator on those platforms understands that on each platform you're also dealing with different community standards. So one of the things I I, I give many props to, to Michael for being uh, you know all about the First Amendment and a free speech warrior. The fact is that a lot of these platforms they are not whether it's uh, whether they're you know because they're uh, you know based in foreign countries right. So when it comes down to uh, the type of stuff that you're able to put there, you're often dealing with different sensors, you know, and that can make it tough to develop a, an audience online. So that's why, uh, it, uh, you know, that, that's definitely a, a mark against it. Uh, next question. <laughs> can you believe it? The old guy doesn't know how a microphone works. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought it? Question, please. First name is Gene. <laughs> Last name is Epstein. <laughs> and you're and you're about to hang yourself. See this gentleman here. Do you see this saying? gentleman here has a name, Gene? <laughs> the question is to Michael, please, Gene. Are you saying that? that wokeness has meant that certain jokes are indeed inadmissible, even though some people laugh at them. For example, there are many racist jokes that I grew up with, having been born in 1944, and jokes about handicapped people. Uh, Big fan of Oppenheimer <laughs> over here. <laughs> we, we, Jews, we Jews, for example, have jokes about Gentiles. Yeah. And like one of them is, why did, God make, why did God make Gentiles? Because somebody has to pay retail. You know, open mic is later, James, so what, what is your question? Please. Nick, Nick always does this to me. The point is that, the question is, are you saying that a joke that, uh, that's racist oriented that says that Basically, as a group, Gentiles are, are stupider than Jews, who are smarter than Gentiles. Do you think that that, is that something that woke has destroyed, but that on net, woke has brought benefits? No, I, no, because Thank Jews you. are smarter. <laughs> that's, just, that's just a fact. Are there, are there good jokes? Are there good jokes to say about that? Um, it's, an, it's actually an interesting example, Gene, because the, the conceit behind the Jew-Gentile joke right there that you just described is about, um, it is about a minority speaking, uh, so, sort of, you know, punching up in a sense because the Gentile is the, is the group that has the power in the culture. Now, there's a difference between that and let's say, you mentioned Eddie Murphy before. Eddie Murphy came out in his like 1983 album, I think it's called Comedian? Is it it? De um, Delirious? 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 And whatever it is. He comes out and, the f and li literally like one of the first two things he says is, uh, I've got rules on my show. And the first rule is, old people with no sense of humor, you know, you get out right now. The second thing is, and he uses the slur for gay people, those people, uh, uh, I've got to the script the joke. I already screwed it up by not saying the word, but those people don't look at my ass, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying, you know, he's, he's using the F word there. Yeah. And I was thinking about that and thinking about what if he had come out, because I'm Jewish, what if he had come out and been like, and you know, my other rule is no, and I'll use the K word, uh, no K, K is allowed at my show because I know what they're looking at. They're always looking at my wallet. Like, how would I feel about that as an audience member? Like, would I think, oh, that's hilarious and I should just go along for the ride? Or, would it like actually kind of hurt me? 
And I feel like I feel like it would be hurtful because it's based on the cheapest sort of dumb stereotypes, the same way his joke about gay people is based on the cheapest dumb stereotypes. I, I agree that the, the cheapness of the joke has nothing to do with any Jewish stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think I think wokeness today, we look at that at that joke, at that situation, the context of that joke, and then we need to start doing this intersectional math, right, to determine whether or not the man making that joke is actually at a lower status uh, than the, the than the subject of the joke, and uh, it can get really really confusing because uh, terrible math. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, my name is Kay, uh, and it occurs to me that... I, is it the K word? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> <laughs> is there a K word? Okay. Oh, there is a K word. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It occurs to me that... Kike is that word. Is that <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. I can say it. Luke can't say it. <laughs> That grease bag can't say it. I can say it. I can say it. <laughs> sorry, I'm you're gonna, sorry, Kay. Kay, Michael, you you're going to hear from my lawyer, <laughs> which is also you. <laughs> Kay, you have the floor. Okay, lawyer. I, um, it occurs to me that a good litmus, litmus test for this is if either of you have a joke that you would like to tell but feel you can't because of wokeism. Lou, you want to jump on that grenade first? I, I, I do this thing where if I come up with, um, with a joke that I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should, if I should, if I should tell it, I uh, send it to a friend, and if he laughs, uh, I, 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 I post it. And uh, I have a really bad friend because he <laughs> makes me post all the jokes that, that I shouldn't do. Now, now I might be a little different than than other comedians. I, you know, speaking to other comedians, I know that there a lot of a lot of them are like, I'm not going to post that because I just I don't want the, uh, you know, I don't want the headache. And it could be something that's a great joke. It could be something that's coming from a good place, but they're like, ah, oh, just forget it. So I think we're we are different in that. Michael, what's um, your secret joke that you would like to broadcast to <laughs> everywhere in America? I'm trying to think about it. I, I don't think I have one. Like, I used to do If I Had a Slave pretty regularly on stage. <laughs> like, I used to read it out loud pretty regularly. And I guess the truth is, like, I probably wouldn't do it now. Um, but maybe I would. Maybe I would. That remains to be seen. Um, can I have, uh, I hate to do this to you, sir, but can you hold on for a second? I want to take the question from the woman behind you and then we'll come to you. Uh, uh, um, it's actually Mary? a sexist move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally. uh, your name? Uh, Mary, and shout out to The Reason Magazine and Foundation. Um, I, yeah. Um, so, Mike, you said that um, wokeness has been a net positive to comedy, in your opinion. Do you think cancel culture also has been? And I'm curious if, if, if your opponents see as any positive on cancel culture in comedy in general. Thank you. I don't think we've seen any examples of cancel culture in comedy, at least as it relates to speech. Um, none that I can think of. Certainly none that have stuck. I mean, who's been canceled in comedy? Can you think of any of them? Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the examples that I have are sort of like happening like across the pond, like um, where I think that they might have a you know uh, a lot you know stronger. Uh, Not only do you read the New Yorker, but you say across the pond. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I think you should check that twenty three and Me again. Yeah. I think. <laughs> where is this Latino really from? <laughs> Are his ancestors from <laughs> Germany? <laughs> is there an example? Uh, um, I, I think uh, 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 Graham Linehan is probably uh, an example. Um, uh, so he, on, on can you explain who he is? Very uh, so uh, for those of you who, who might not be cultured, um, <laughs> uh, Graham uh, was, uh, he wrote uh, uh, Father Ted, which is a very popular uh, sitcom over there. And, and the Graham, IT crowd. Well. And the IT crowd. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, I never saw that one. My nanny wouldn't allow me. 
<laughs> IT. Ooh, dirty. Um, man, and how gauche. We had au pairs. <laughs> <laughs> so does that speak to the question of wokeness killing comics? Um, I, I think so. I mean, Graham, uh, see, part of the thing about wokeness is, you, you, is there are certain things that somehow become, uh, you know, trip liars, like saying that I believe that uh, a woman is, adult, is an adult female. Um, or I believe that there are, you know, biological differences between men and women and, and that sort of thing. And Graham, uh, you know, got himself into trouble for saying things like that. Um, and it's uh, pretty un unfortunate. Uh, let's go to the next question, please. Hey, guys. My name is Brent Morden. First of all, thank you for being here and sharing your perspectives. Uh, to preface my question, uh, regardless <laughs> of... I know, I know. This, I'll make it quick. Mm. Um, Just ask the question. Brent, where is comedy thriving? And what, what can we do and what can the world do to ensure the thriving of comedy? Uh, the only place I would say comedy is not thriving right now is in uh, sort of Hollywood movies, yeah. the sort of mid-range Hollywood movie. Other than that, I feel like it's ah. never been in better shape. I mean, you, you, the, the, every medium-sized city has at least one comedy club, podcasts. Um, um, t television comedy is really good right now. Internet comedy is really good. TikTok, Instagram, like there's so politics. many. Ab politics. <laughs> um, um, very funny. So it's uh, comedy is thriving. Do you agree with that? I mean, uh, I agree that, that Ted Cruz is a hilarious Latinx yeah. politician. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And if you have a problem with that, maybe you should check your privilege. <laughs> All right, let, uh, next question, please. Yeah, don't get <laughs> you're you're in a comedy club debating yes. comedy. Okay. That's the context. Okay. Is it true comedy if comedians feel hindered and become inauthentic? And if it's not true comedy, isn't it currently dead? Even if through social mores it can be revived. Mm. Uh, you were looking at Michael, but yeah, I think I want to have oh. Lou answer that first. Okay. Um, I, I think authenticity is is very good. Uh, if authenticity is your brand, go go for it. I talked to a PR person, and they're like, just try to be as authentic as you can, but be smart about it. Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 view, I view comedy like, uh, like all the arts, um, where, uh, you know, I, I think Michael was quoted on a, on a show and, uh, where he said, like, when you guys were with the state, uh, you guys were very much yourselves and, and who you were at the time and you obviously you know matured uh, It's been a long time uh, You know, I, th I think there is something there and I think that that, that Authenticity there's something that, that speaks to people if you you are presenting your true self in the way that you view the world I think so. That's why I love his song Minaj so much <laughs> He just speaks to the Muslim experience and the hatred that Muslims experience every day so beautifully do you, do you worry at all, though, to the, the questioner's uh, point, does a fear of reprisal like term, you know, make people into If your less authentic self is going to generate the kind of reprisal that people are, that you're afraid of, maybe you need to look at yourself a little bit more carefully. I mean, if you're... If you're on it, I mean, if your thing is you want to get up on stage and say, fuck these trannies and fuck these Jews and fuck these everybody else, aren't I hilarious? You could do it in a porn. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> Not in comedy. And I know I wasn't supposed to curse, but it. But fuck NPR, too. <laughs> It's, you're showing your true self. Yeah, now okay. this is my authentic self. Next, <laughs> all of you. Let's, <laughs> let's try to get two questions in real quick. Sir, your question. Hi, my name's Ed. Um, Blazing Saddles was brought up, and Lou, I was glad you pushed back against that as kind of a de facto. My question to both is, is there something that you admired that came out in the last five years or so that wouldn't have come out 40 years ago, like an I'm pregnant or plan B? a comedy about teen girls getting an abortion. Thank you. Uh, well, shoot, I already used my good example, which is Barbie, which is a really good example. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I have a I have a two year old and a three year old, so my movie watching experience has been Luca turning red and rewatching. Yeah, Schindler's List. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next question. We're gonna try and get a couple more in real quick. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lola. I have a quick question. Uh, if White Chicks were to be made again in a sequel, well, and the studio approached either of you, what would your response be? Would you, would you participate? White Chicks, um, a movie by the Wayne Brothers, where they where they look like Shrek, white, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, are you y yes or no, Michael? Are you in that project? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Anything that pays me money, I'm doing. Yeah, okay. sure. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Uh, and let's have one more question, sir. Uh, my name is Robert. Uh, in, in deference, in deference to the NPR audience at home, I will identify myself as a Catholic West Indian Black queer Republican. <laughs> Damn. Another one. Wait, I, uh, and know, so I guess the question. Just pack the audience oh, with them. <laughs> Uh, in, in deference to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, M Michael Lee in blackface. The question that I, the, uh, the, the question I would put forward to you is that, do you think it's, it is, to use a, a favorite phrase, problematic, uh, that uh, a comedian has to be of a certain identity to make jokes about that identity. It seems to me that you, the, the one area of, of wokeness is that you are not allowed to really have these uh, cross-identity kind of jokes that we uh, may have had in the past. Thank you. Um, yes and no. Yes, I do think that that is a fear and a concern. No. I think comedians can do it and do do it if they're kind of, if they're not sort of locked in on one target. Like the thing that makes Chappelle, I think, such a like good example of this is he's so locked in on the transgender thing that it makes, it, to, at least to me, it, it makes him kind of ugly as a comedian because he's so focused on this one thing. Whereas if he sort of distributed his opprobrium uh, more equally, I think it, 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 it would have the opposite effect. Like a good example of this, we talked about John, uh, uh, Don Rickles before, is um, uh, Jeff Ross, who has sort of inherited Don Rickles' mantle as an insult comedian. If you don't know him, he calls himself the Roastmaster General. He goes out, he makes fun of people, and he is beloved. I mean, he's kind of anti-woke. He's doing the Don Rickles thing, and it goes over beautifully because it's... It's funny. Luke? Nothing. <laughs> All right, that concludes our audience for today. Thank you. Thank you all. And I say that as a Gentile, so I realize I'm missing most of the jokes, along with all the distance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys, you both made excellent points. Now is the time to bring it home with closing remarks. Lou, you're up first. Tell us why this audience should be convinced that wokeness is killing comedy. You got two minutes. Sure. Um, the other day, I got to sit down and interview Nadine Strassen, who's a former president of the ACLU. <laughs> And I spoke to Nadine, she has an incredible personal story. Her father is a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, he was set to be sterilized the day after US GIs uh, freed him from his camp. So here's a woman whose very existence hung in the balance. In, in an alternate uh, reality, a day later, the world would not have a Nadine Strassen. And she would go on decades later to head the American Civil Liberties Union that would defend the speech of neo-Nazis, the very people who would have destroyed her father and her existence. And while that was going on during that interview, all I could think about was 
Man, I gotta talk with Michael Ian Black for... Oh, man. I missed a lot of her story. <laughs> I was just thinking about, man, I need, like, uh, examples of stuff that he did, and that was bad. Was he ever a Nazi? Could I, could I use that? But all this is to say, um, I, 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 I str believe very strongly in free speech uh, as, a de as a defender of it, and I look up to people like Nadine, like the ACLU, like the Foundation for Indiv Individual Rights and Expression does right now to support uh, and protect even the speech that we hate. And one of the great things that we get when we protect the speech that we hate is that we get some good jokes, too. And I want to make sure that we continue that and not allow wokeness to kill comedy. Thank you, Lou. And now, Michael, you have the final say here. Your rebuttal, please. Well, I was talking to Eli Wiesel, <laughs> and he agrees with me. OK, Lou? He agrees with me. just pull Holocaust survivor out of your pocket when you're doing a debate on comedy. That's unfair. That is a low blow. Look, we agree, essentially. We agree that free speech needs to be protected at all costs. My argument is we haven't seen it be curtailed here in the world of comedy even a little bit. Free speech is flourishing, it's alive, it's well. I have a joke in my act about the First Amendment when I, where I say, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a proud American, and one of the things I love so much is our First Amendment, which means I can get up on this stage and say whatever I want, and it will be fine. And then if you do the same, meaning the audience, I will have you removed. <laughs> Free speech for me, not for thee. Comedy is flourishing, it's alive, it's well. Having a little bit more, uh, being a little bit more front of mind about other people's experiences, I think is a good thing to end. I will quote the British actor, uh, Kathy Burke who's on AbFab and other <laughs> such things, she said, I love being woke. It's much nicer than being an ignorant effing twit. <laughs> but she didn't use the word F, and she didn't say twit. Uh, but again, this is NPR. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. We're going to ask the audience your opinion again to see if you may have shifted your stance on the question. <laughs> Is wokeness killing comedy? So after having heard this debate, I'm going to have you applaud to show your stance. Yes, no, and undecided. We're going to start with yes. Clap if you think yes, wokeness is killing comedy. Okay, now clap if you think, no, wokeness is not killing comedy. <laughs> and finally, clap if you're undecided. Well, there, there were some shifts there. I have to say to my aging ears that it sounds like Michael Ian Black, who argued no wokeness is not killing comedy, prevailed tonight. So congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, you know, there's one last poll that I want to take uh, here. Interested to know whether you changed your mind or not. And, you know, maybe not even on the whole question, but... Did you hear an argument from the other side that really gave you something to think about 
even if you weren't fully convinced. Well, that's, that's uh, very uh, good to hear. People uh, listening to other sides of arguments and, and uh, you know, admitting it, that uh, the other side has a point from time to time. That concludes our debate. I'd like to thank our debaters and everyone here at the Comedy Cellar for keeping such an open mind while listening to this insightful debate. And occasionally profane debate. <laughs> Open to Debate is a nonprofit organization. We think we're offering value to public discourse. And if you agree, we'd love your support. <laughs> and I think by support they meant money. Uh, but, you know, clapping is the first you know, step in and showing that you have a problem, I guess. Sign up for our newsletter and find other ways to support us at opentodebate.org. Tune in to hear this and other episodes Saturday at 6 on WNYC, and make sure you're subscribed to Open to Debate wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Nick Gillespie, and thank you for joining us at this Open to Debate live taping. Thank you.